Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Hamid, and I am the programs manager here at the Center for Book Arts. Thank you for joining us this evening. I recognize that we are in the midst of an intense election, and you could be watching so many other things right now. So I really appreciate you joining us today. The Center for Book Arts is located in the heart of Manhattan on 27th Street and Broadway. It was founded in 1974 by Richard Minsky, who's here tonight. It's the first space of its kind dedicated to, it's the first space of its kind in the United States dedicated to exploring the book as an art object through classes, residencies, exhibitions, public programs, and so much more. You can learn more about our history and programs at centerforbookarts.org. If you're in the area, if you're in the tri-state area, you can visit us um, using our reserved ticketed time slots. Um, and you can see that on our website, centerforbookarts.org slash exhibitions. One of our current exhibitions, Marcos Key Makes Reads, is an exhibition honoring our 2020 faculty fellows, Wet El Marcos and John Key. In 2018, they launched Marcos Key, an award-winning Brooklyn-based graphic design studio with a hybrid practice operating between social impact, pedagogy, and creative form. The studio collaborates with arts and cultural institutions, nonprofits, and commercial enterprises in North America and the Middle East. Their investment in, dear, in queer and diasporic identities have guided them in developing roots in community building within multicultural contexts. To facilitate understanding while avoiding oversimplification, they leverage design choices as, guide, as guideposts between the injustices of, a, of the past and a more equitable future. With the strong emphasis on language and letter design, Morcos Key translates clients' stories and missions through vis, visual identity, print, and digital systems. Much of the work produced by the studio is premised on the interplay of text, language, heritage, and function. The exhibition, which is currently up at the Center for Book Arts, take viewers through a selection of print materials designed by Wattel and John. Journals, books, newsprints, zines, type specimens, and more. These books are displayed alongside selections from their personal library, 
demonstrating the conceptual and aesthetic influence of the duo's design process and creative practice. Anyone who attends the exhibition receives a free limited edition brochure designed by Isabel Chiang, which also includes an exclusive interview with Debbie Millman, acclaimed designer, author, educator, curator, and the host of the Design Matters podcast. Programs like these would not be possible without the support of our members, donors, students, and audience members who have been the biggest supporters during this time of transition. I'd also like to acknowledge the support from the New York State Council on the Arts with support of Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature and by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with City Council. Tonight, Wa'el and John will walk us through their practice and we'll take audience questions at the end of their presentation. So as a reminder, please stay muted and keep your videos off. You can post your questions and reactions in the chat for the discussion portion later on in the evening. Lastly, this event will be live streamed and recorded on Facebook for our, on Facebook and our YouTube page for future viewings. So now I welcome Wa'el Morcos and John Key. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having us. So we have a presentation to share. We're going to share our screen. And just perhaps you can get some verbal confirmation from someone that you can see this. Jenna, is the screen sharing working? Yes, it looks good. Perfect. Okay, great. So hi, we're so excited to be here to talk about our work. Thank you so much, Jenna and the Center of Book Arts for having us. I am John Key. I'm Wael Morcos. And together we make Morcos Keys. So I'm the key in Morcos Key and Wael is the Morcos. Um, just a quick kind of background about where we are or who we are, where we're from. So I'm originally from Seal, Alabama, a small rural town. And I think, you know, reflecting on growing up in Alabama, I was very involved in the arts, starting from an early age. You know, church choir, church pageants, playing recorder, playing piano, doing, you know, so many different types of activities, doing theater, doing band, doing music. My mom had a craft table for us, my twin and I, so she really encouraged us to do arts and craft as an early age. And I think for me, I learned that so many different types of visual expressions is so important to really express who you are. And through all of these different mediums, it's really you know, a powerful way for self-expression. Uh, and I am from Lebanon, more specifically from Beirut, from the Northern suburbs of Beirut. I grew up in this cosmopolitan country speaking four languages. Lebanon is a tiny country, so a lot of people who grow up in Lebanon tend to have a very outwardly look at the world and uh, being influenced with what's happening all around. So that was no difference to me. Um, I studied graphic design in Lebanon, and then I worked for many years in Lebanon as well, before moving to the US for my master's in graphic design um, at the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, which is where I met John who was also studying graphic design. Yeah, so I was an undergrad at graphic design in Providence, Rhode Island. And I think again, taking with me all of my love and passion for the arts really landed me at an art school. And, you know, as I was ending my time at RISD, you know, I was really questioning what did it mean to be a graphic designer? And specifically for me, what does it mean to be a graphic designer from the South? What does it mean to be a graphic designer who is Black, a graphic designer that is queer? And really figuring out, you know, you know, that really laid a foundation, kind of trying to answer these questions about who I am and the type of work that I like to do. Uh, and I think after meeting at RISD, we started collaborating together on several projects and kind of as an artist or designer or practitioner in the creative field, you always need somebody to bounce on the ideas off that helps you get out of your own head and keep pushing the work, for, the work forward, which is how uh, John and I started collaborating together at RISD before moving to New York, where we also took a couple of design jobs at several studios around the city. 
and uh, we had full time jobs that we kept collaborating together on freelance on the side the whole time. Yeah, so I mean, like what I was saying, like class assignments was our initial kind of collaborations, but then that led to us moving to New York and I got a full time gig at, you know, my first job was at Gray Advertising, where I was working on, you know, Robotessen, an emergency, but eventually working on the Whitney Museum and the campaign moving from the Upper East Side to the Meatpacking District, which again, kind of validated for me this passion for arts and cultural institutions of being an artist and working with artwork and design. And like what I was saying, you know, still on the side producing freelance work, trying to find clients that really align with my passions in my community. Uh, <clears throat> after a while, we decided to uh, join our freelance effort and quit our full-time jobs and start a design practice that we called Marcos Key. And so this is a picture from our lunch party about three years ago, where we were officially kind of celebrating our opening. And, you know, we like to show our glamour shot to people, um, but also it's just a really important, I think, pivotal moment for us. Which brings us to our exhibition that we're having at the Center of Book Arts. And so the title of this exhibition is Makes Read, and it really is interrogating and investigating our own editorial practice as a graphic design studio via personal projects, via client work, but also what projects in our library, what projects in our personal collection also inspire our work. And so it's a dialogue between our work that we make and work by our friends, work by other artists, work by historical objects that really do inform who we are, what type of work we're trying to make. And really, again, in this editorial publication lens. Yeah, I think the idea was that culture as a whole and graphic design more specifically do not operate in silos. They kind of feed off each other and the work that, and the conversation that are taking place in in the public discourse. And we wanted to reflect on that idea that our work as well does not live in silo, that our train of thought lives in a world of the universe of influences and inspirations and uh, things that we look at and we read as well as the things that we make. So we wanted these two kind of sides to be in dialogue. So we decided that one of the walls at the Center for Book Arts will be dedicated to reads and the other wall will be dedicated to makes at the either ends of the exhibition space. And so what we're going to do kind of quickly is <clears throat> take you through kind of a general history of our work and kind of an overview of some projects that we've done in the past. And then we're going to delve into some of the editorial projects that we actually feature in the exhibition and talk about the process and talk about our, their importance to us in our community. Um, so this slide, for example, is examples, <laughs> don't mind our cat, <laughs> Cooper. <laughs> um, but this slide, for example, is just really great examples of first collaborations by Wael and I. And I think it also emphasizes the things that we love. So, you know, this is a poster, a theatrical poster for Equus to play. And it's one of the first collaborations we did when we were at RISD, actually. And I think, again, it talks about our love for theater, it talks about our love for arts and culture and protest in terms of the middle one typography. And then similarly with the Beirut poster and the, um, the post in the center, you know, all of these things are kind of artifacts of our own experiences, our backgrounds, and our identities. Other examples of things that we've done are websites. So this was an example of a website that we did for commercial type, which was a commercial type is a type foundry based in New York. And we were asked to help them showcase their new online web fonts. And so we created 14 microsites for them that really express the narrative pinnings of the, the web thoughts. Other examples are um, branding for educational institutions. So this is a brand that we did for Booker T. Washington High School in New Orleans. And what just strikes me about this project specifically is that this was the first time the school had opened after Katrina. So that was like 20, 25 years later, and really trying to create a symbol and identity that really encompasses the pride of the community and give them you know, the joy of the school reopening. Other projects range to branding projects again for arts and cultural institutions. So this is a logo and identity system that we did for Heartbeat Opera, which is an opera company that is trying to bring, you know, a very conservative traditional 
uh, medium to younger audiences, to contemporary audiences in a fresh ragtag, urgent way. And so when we're building this identity, we wanted to really emphasize the hand and the personal and this urgency and this play between this brushy typography and this kind of sleek digital collage and this interplay between these two textures. And so you can see the system being carried across in collateral and different events, kind of all the things they do. And one of the things I love about Heartbeat Opera is the, that they really do approach um, opera in such a fun way so and, and out of different contexts. So again, they do a drag opera show every year, taking traditional opera context and putting them in an interesting way. And as designers, we get to use our skills to help them bring forth this playfulness, bring forth this kind of queerness as well in terms of something that might be a bit more um, refined. Um, another example of things that we work with a lot of kind of cultural institutions like museums. And so this is a project that we did for the Studio Museum in Harlem, celebrating their gala of 2018, but also the 50 year anniversary of the institution in terms of thinking about how do we bring to life this black tie event, but also like they said, they like to dance and party. So how can you kind of blend these two languages together and create something that is, you know, very institutional, very refined, but something that's also playful and unexpected um, as well. And I just want to pause on this because, I mean, in the light of all the election stress and everything that we all are experiencing right now, I just love this idea that our work is being kind of side by side with the Obamas. And, you know, it's just very inspirational for me to just see this image. And I think it's, you know, things that we kind of strive for. And then obviously Thelma Golden, who is the director of the Studio Museum in Harlem. And so kind of delving more specifically into some of the editorial content that we have in the exhibition is the 10th Magazine. And so the 10th Magazine is a Black queer fashion lifestyle magazine that was started by Kari Seth in the middle, Andre Vernon on the top left, and Cal Banks in the bottom right. And so the 10th really is interrogating what does it mean to be Black and queer in America and dismissing this idea that the Black queer community is a monolith and really trying to talk to and speak to our own community by owning the voice. And so one of the issues that we're going to, we are talking about a few issues, but and all of these issues are in the exhibition, so you can delve in more if you are able to make it. But the fourth issue was this issue about technology and thinking about queer people and the intersections of technology and media and social media. And one of the things that I love about this project and this idea is taking digital interfaces and tying it with the print form and really querying this idea of what is a way that you can view and read editorial content based off of uh, instances that we use online and on our computers. And also what I love about the 10th Magazine in general is that they really do find these specific stories about our community. Like I love this idea of Malcolm Gamer X and I'm not a gamer at all, but I just love this idea that gaming to me is a space that's supposed to be freedom. And they really do talk about still some of the things that they have to overcome being queer people, even in this kind of avatar space. Um, another thing that I think is a great thing about this collaboration is the photographers and brands that we get to work with. So Hood by Air is a very popular black queer fashion brand that's kind of actually on a hiatus right now. Um, but I just love that we get to work with these types of brands and also the photographers like Marcus Branch and Camilio and Harvey Jackson that really allows you know, these images to punctuate the stories that we're telling. Another issue that's also featured in the exhibition is the romanticism issue. And again, you know, one of the things that I love about the 10th Magazine is that it's this delve into history. And also each issue is its own world. And as graphic designers, we really get to play with the form of the storytelling. So just as a pause, you know, I just love this typography that is built out of kind of 19th century, 18th century pseudoscientific paintings of flowers that we then sculpt into letter forms. 
And then kind of all of this issue is really talking to and speaking to the dreamer, the idealist, the artist, the person that is still living in the world fully and committing to this kind of romantic idea of self and making. And also these stories that really, again, elevate queer people. And this story is about Michelle Michelet, who's a trans woman and also a world-renowned Beyonce impersonator, surprisingly. And, you know, I just love this kind of period piece looking at his historical spaces in Hudson and really reclaiming these narratives that, that have been lost. And then the final issue of the 10th magazine that I want to talk about is Calicod. And, you know, one of the things that I love, again, like the 10th magazine is trying to interrogate the landscape of American queer culture, Black queer culture, and thinking about this idea of West Coast meeting this East Coast Cape, Cape Cod, Provincetown aesthetic. And so, you know, and I guess also one of the other things about this issue is that this is the first time that we're really celebrating all of the creators and makers who put the work in over the years. You know, the, the magazine has been around for six or seven years, uh, who've been the creators of the issues. So it's kind of leisure and celebration meets history. And so, you know, we all kind of gathered in this poor town of Provincetown in Massachusetts and, you know, reflecting on other poor towns and generations of, you know, enslaved Africans that were brought to this country, which is what this story kind of interrogates. And I also just want to call out my twin, Jared Key, did these illustrations, these paintings that really kind of speak to this idea of transgenerational lineage and trauma and, you know, voice. And so like I was saying, you know, this issue is really about leisure and celebration. And it's kind of one of the more playful issues, I think, out of the, the mix. And so the next issue that we're actually working on for the 10th magazine is called Pen Pals. And it's looking at queer and trans people of color, specifically Black people, and the intersections of um, incarceration and the prison industrial complex. And literally, we were writing letters, the 10th team was writing letters with um, people who are in jail and then talking about their stories post incarceration and really, you know, these ideas of thriving and survival, which I think are topics and um, subjects that we need to hear now. Um, another book that is also in the collection at the exhibition is We. And so We is a zine that I made in response to the Black Lives Matter movement starting in 2015 in Ferguson, and really thinking about the images that we were seeing on the news and in media and relating to images of, of history and you know early, earlier instances of the civil rights movement. And so like this is an example of Emmett Till and Trayvon Martin, both young Black boys who were taken too soon by, you know, force of brutality and really finding messages through photography, through archives, through the Library of Congress and contemporary messages made by my hand and putting them together in the same frame. Um, and yeah, and also trying to find these new conversations uh, or new mantras of resilience um, that I think was in contrast to some of the language that is happening. Can I mention the acetone? Oh yeah, we can talk about that a little bit. And so yeah, all of these are all um, image transfers, collages with acetone. So I literally kind of archive, go through archives and find these images and print them out and then physically put them together with acetone transfers to create these um, tactile collages. And, you know, just a little bit more, you know, thinking about a book that just came out that we wish we could have included in this exhibition is Black Features, which is a book by uh, Kimberly Drew and Jenna Wortham that we had the honor to design, which is investigating, again, what does it mean to be Black in America today and looking at kind of historical instances starting from the 1980s and pop culture and history in terms of how our voices have contributed to uh, survival, to thriving through uh, healing. Um, and so it's a combination of art and interviews and essays and 
photojournalism, you know, made by over a hundred artists and designers. And so, yeah, we just got our first mock-up of this book. And so this is our, our uh, digital rendering for now, but it will be out. You can pre-order it now. It'll be out in December. Um, and yeah, we're really excited about it. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Um, I'm going to take over the second half of this showcase. I am Wael Morcos. Like I said, I'm originally from Lebanon uh, in the Middle East, and I speak Arabic. And Arabic is, um, uh, I mean, typography in general is one of the most important tools in our toolbox. It has the ability to give shape to ideas, to words, uh, and to give a, an additional layer of meaning to what the uh, writer intends. Um, so a lot of the work that we do is dedicated to the development of modern Arabic typography and to help the rich heritage of Arabic calligraphy be translated and carried over and reinterpreted to uh, kind of, um, you know, be a tool for our modern times. So many times I get uh, invited to give workshops and I dedicate these to uh, make them Arabic lettering workshop. So alongside Christian Serkis and Khazag Apelian, we started this um, this uh, series of workshops that we call the Arabic lettering workshops. And each of them, each one of them is dedicated to a specific theme um, and focused on specific skills. The one on the left uh, was trying to investigate the emotional potential and expressive uh, quality of Arabic. So the, participant in, the participants in the workshops were picking emojis and trying to translate that through typography. Uh, workshop number eight, the one on the right, was about low resolution screen, uh, screens and gaming uh, uh, arcade games that used low resolution screen to render graphics on it and to see how can uh, organic smooth curves can, can also translate it to these more rigid grids. The one on the left here, number 10, was about Arabic uh, Kufi, which is a geometric type of Arabic script that also can be adaptable and malleable that we did at the New York Times. And number 12 on the right is one that we did at the Type Directors Club and it was inspired by the billboards of New York City. Uh, but a lot of our work also focuses specifically on Arabic type design and that is designing fonts, which is actually drawing the letters that constitute this font, this piece of software. And uh, with a very you know, globalized and even more connected world that we live in, there's a growing need for uh, multi-script typographies, fonts that not only cover the Latin script, but cover other scripts as well. And a lot of the work that we get commissioned to do is designing Arabic uh, counterparts for existing and popular Latin fonts. This one is a, a collaboration with Khajak Apelian and Mike Abing for designing the Arabic counterpart for a font called Brando. Um, that's available from the type foundry called Bold Monday. Um, and our goal is a very, I mean, Arabic typography in general has had a very contentious relationship with technology, which uh, specifically printing technology, which has always been developed and uh, uh, with Western detached letters in mind. So Arabic has had trouble kind of um, keeping up or adapting itself to whether it's metal blocks of letters or uh, limited keyboards on typewriters or digital screens that we use on the phones today. So it's really exciting to be able to participate in that field and provide um, you know, funds for other, de other designers. Uh, the one we're looking at now is another one called Graphic Arabic for a uh, counterpart of graphic from uh, at the foundry called Commercial Type here in New York City. It comes in nine weights. <clears throat> and uh, we designed a these the promotional gifts that show the typeface in use, but also a booklet that was printed that shows how this modern type can adapt itself to complex layouts. So each spread in this booklet actually is an entirely different layout. For example, this one reinterprets the old illuminated manuscripts of, of Arabic and the way they deal with the footnotes and the margins. And this one is more of a flat texture mixing different type of numbers on the page, uh, typesetting on grids, uh, more complicated functional layouts, playing with column width, layering, and mixing multiple languages within one uh, line. Um, what's more, most interesting about this type of project is that as a designer, you're designing a tool. A font is a tool for other people to use to typeset their own messages, their own content. And what you are basically providing is a flavor 
that they can add to their messaging when they use this fund. So it's pretty exciting to see that you're designing something that someone else can use after you. Uh, but it also comes in handy in our own projects because we also get asked a lot of time to help companies and uh, corporate uh, publications to expand to new markets and specifically Middle East and therefore expand their communication logos and branding to cover uh, other scripts like Bloomberg Business Week that was originally designed by Christian Schwartz from Commercial Type. And then we helped create the signature that would be used in around the Middle East and in Pakistan. That said, alongside um, type design, we also do branding um, for multi-script um, corporations like Mizna. So this is the identity that Mizna had. And Mizna is, a, <clears throat> is an American-based organization that deals with foregrounding uh, Arab American prose and poetry. Um, and as they grew and continue growing, they started having different events like a podcast and a film festival, one of the largest, uh, actually the largest Arab film festival in North America. And their crown jewel is the journal that, that, that they publish uh, quite often. But as you can see, their graphic tools became a little bit inadequate because they didn't have any consistency across them. There was not a clear voice or a visual vocabulary that links all these different things. So they came to us with the help to not do an entire rebrand, but help them kind of put things back in order and refresh the visual look of their identity. Um, so because starting with the logo, you can tell that the Arabic and the English kind of operates on two different levels and they wanted this visual cohesion. But we kind of were drawn to the symmetry that exists in the Arabic logo already. And instead of just proposing something entirely new, we just redrew their logo and kind of uh, simplify the geometry and build something that is entirely uh, abstracted, but also simplified. And then we went back to calligraphy and looked at one of the features of Arabic. As I might have mentioned, Arabic is a connected script. Uh, and this elongation that connects the letters horizontally can actually be extended. And that is usually used for uh, justification purposes or creating a hierarchy in the layout, like you see in this example on the title to kind of fill the space on top. So we kind of use this elongation on the baseline device to create a logo that stretches and is elastic and allows itself to kind of be a little bit more playful. And that will help them use it in different ways, but also create a system for how they can use it on their communication material. And imagine this identity as something that is live alive and fluid. And what they will do is just stretch it to fill the uh, width of whatever layout surface they're working with from print to screen, and it will act as a masthead. And based on that, they, we added the layer of colors to the brand and the secondary typography that helps them speak in a varied but yet uh, unified uh, voice uh, for their um, organization. And when you put all these ingredients together, you see how the system starts coming together in a fluid way that is still clean and modern and, and exciting. And here's some of the collateral that they use with the journal, some of the uh, uh, assets that they can also use online for their website, how the logo stretches as a mass set also on their website, several journals. And this is their first journal that we designed for them that helped launch the new identity using the new logo. And you can see that the logo is also applied on the spine of the journal. And when it came to the film festival, we also wanted to use that idea of elongation to create a typographic clock cup that uses this elongation, but also looks like a film strip and animates as, as such, like a projection of, of, a, of a film and can have work in a horizontal signature or a vertical signature as well. And they have been using this logo since. So you can see it here in use. And for the winners of the Arabic Film Festival, we wanted to create a special Laurel uh, Award uh, signature. So we went back to their story and were inspired by the olive leaves to create this kind of customizable uh, visual trophies, if you will, for the participants that actually win at the festivals. And this is an example of the identity in use. 
Um, back to Arabic typography, we recently launched uh, Lyon Arabic, a counterpart for a text face, also by commercial type. What's special about this project is that Lyon has a very uh, specific italic and was inspired by the early cuts of Grand Jean, which is also a cousin of Time New Roman. So it has this kind of timeless classic feel to it. And when we wanted to adapt this system to Arabic, we did not want to draw one Arabic and then slant and push the design to make an italic, but we wanted to give it the respect that Latin typography gives it, which is the italic is actually a cursive redrawn italic and not, not the Roman construction that's slanted or tilted. So again, we went back to calligraphy and uh, to look at how um, you know, the manuscript treated this hierarchy on the page. And if you notice at the uh, writing on top, it uses what we call nastalik or the Persian proportions of the Arabic that is much more fluid and has this kind of slant in it versus the nasq that you see on the four lines at the bottom that is the more traditional um, proportions for reading text. So we used this as a starting point for our concept and developed two different families, the Yon Slanted that you see here on the left, that kind of mixes Nasr and proportion from the Nastalik to bring this fluidity and slant to the design. And what you see on the right, which is more of a modernized Nasr that will be used to match the Roman proportion of the Latin. So eventually we ended up with um, a type system that has two variations, the upright and the slanted. And um, it was released a couple of months ago also through commercial type. Um, another thing that we really love about make creating fonts is that we get to test them in the project that we work on. So this is a completely young family and we see it here in use as well. And these are two books that were the first application that we put Lyon to use. We designed the catalogs for the Sharjah Architectural Triennial uh, that happened early early this year or by the end of 2019. Um, and what we wanted to decreate with the curator Adrian Lahoud of the of uh, of the um, of the triennial is to create two publications that one is entirely Arabic and one is entirely English, and then use a system that would help the design itself be kind of reflective and mirror itself in, in these both uh, scripts. So for example, you can see these spreads and you see how the layout itself is entirely mirrored. Arabic as a script goes from right to left uh, and Latin goes from left to right. So the whole book opens the other way around. So basically we had to do a lot of adjustments to kind of flip the whole grid and system and find ways to use typography that allows for this uh, uh, complexity in the hierarchy. So here you see how we use Lyon slanted Arabic on the right for the pullout quotes, just the way the way we use it in the Latin as well. As same for the opening spreads and the pullout quotes. And again, the publication is in Arabic, but there's a lot of uh, Latin typography that had to mix and interact in the footnote, which required a lot of attention to the details. Uh, <clears throat> So this is an overview of several spreads from both books. And Lyon was also used as a typeface for the exhibition by Rayan Tabit that happened at the storefront for art and architecture earlier this week. Uh, and it was titled Arabesque. And Rayan was looking at, uh, at a, a hypothetical meeting between an American architect and a historian uh, who kind of roamed the Middle East looking at architecture and documenting uh, the features of the uh, Middle Eastern architecture. And this is how the word arabesque was born, which was, uh, which is not a word that exists in Arabic. Um, these are images from the exhibition. So for the logo and for the design of the exhibition, we use again, this elongation to create a stretching of the word across the block, uh, the Manhattan block. Uh, and then we use a metaphor of these two meeting points in the way we typeset the text inside the exhibition. So even though they look like a solid block of letters, they actually are um, two different scripts that meet in the middle and create this kind of um, metaphor for migration of idea from one culture to the other. And here again, uh, we use Lyon um, uh, in both script, the upright and slanted to allow us to create the hierarchy of information across these different uh, uh, newsprint that accompany the exhibition itself. And I think this brings us to the end of, of this presentation. So 
thank you for following through. And I think I'm going to stop the screen sharing now. Awesome. So, Wael and John, you guys have a few questions. And I think you're muted. I'm muted. Oh, maybe I am. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, you have some questions in the chat about some of your projects. Do you want me to go through and read them out to you? Yeah. Okay. So, um, the first question is um, how do you find clients and how do your clients find you? <laughs> how do you find clients and how do clients find you? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think a lot of the work that, I mean, we're very involved in our communities. I think that's something else that we could have also added to this, but uh, you know, social media is huge for us. You know, we put things on social media. We participate in a lot of talks and lecture series and I think that's an amazing way to get our work out there. I think, you know, we, you know, self-initiated projects, I think that we started years ago, like the We Magazine, all of the, like the We uh, publication and zine, you know, those projects attract a lot of clients. And yeah, so, I mean, it's just a combination of, you know, kind of putting ourselves out there, but then also a lot of people refer people to us, which is exciting, um, yeah. I think um, what we call business development is something that we're still trying to figure out how to do. Uh, how do you actually get clients to keep the studio growing? But uh, and honestly, it's been happening organically so far. And we've been most of the time very busy that we didn't really actively focus on that area, except, you know, being really passionate and working hard on, on the projects and try to tell the story of these projects. And hopefully people will, understand them, relate them, and we'll want to work with us on, on similar projects. Okay, so um, do you direct the photo shoots um, in any of the magazines that you've designed? Um, do you choose the pictures or manipulate um, and choose the layout? And uh, Sunny B is specifically asking about 10 magazine. Yeah, yeah, for the 10th. So yeah, I mean, our relationship for the 10th is so many things. Uh, Oftentimes, it could be Kari comes to me with an idea about a magazine, and I'm literally feeding images, mood board, and we're having conversations. And then those things are taken to produce photo shoots. Sometimes I'm at the photo shoot, like physically art directing, working with the models, working with the photographers. Um, a lot of the collages I probably did. Um, the illustrations, I mean, we work with a lot of amazing illustrators. And again, I really work as art director, kind of communicating the mood, the visual vocabulary of the issue and translating that to, you know, the various freelancers or illustrators that we're working with. So some of them I have a direct hand in and some of them, they are kind of based off of, you know, the overall mood board journey atmosphere that we're trying, trying to make. Okay, and this next question is about the Black Futures book. Um, do you know if the cover is stamped in hologram foil? Yes, it is. We have, a, we have one. Do you want to grab it? Where is it? We just got it. Yes, so it actually is actually slightly different foil, but it still has the kind of rainbow effect that it has. So yeah, it is actual like um, actual full. And so we can just flip through it really quickly. You know, kind of we did a digital rendering of it, but it looks like that in real life too. <laughs> yeah. Great. So uh, this next question is from Jennifer Yacoub. Um, question to Wael. I'm a designer and I'm interested to learn more about Arabic typography. Do you teach or mentor designers who are looking to learn how to design Arabic typefaces. Also, do you have any recommendations on helpful resources out there? Um, I'll start with the second one. The resources on Arabic typography are not as, as solid as we want them to be, but there are a couple of interesting libraries and books out there. Specifically, the Khat Foundation is publishing interesting things about Arabic visual culture. I would say a lot of what I know about, about Arabic typography is self-taught, is by surrounding my, myself with 
close friends who we kind of like teach each other and collaborate together. Um, so I think that's how one can go about, you know, delving and learning Arabic typography. I have given workshops and lectures on Arabic specifically. Um, the thing about Arabic is such an expansive work and uh, designing typefaces takes a long time. Any of these projects that I showed is usually six to a year, six months to a year um, uh, as a timeline. So it's impossible to kind of mentor and like stay with somebody that long unless you're collaborating on the work together because it takes a lot of involvement. Uh, but I usually, I get sometimes questions on um, on Instagram or by mail with people wanting to show me their progress. And I'm always happy to jump on calls and discuss and give them uh, my, my, my opinion or two cents on what they're doing. And I hope that does help. And you are working with students. I mean, you are working with a student who's making a typeface now. Right, but it's almost <laughs> like a co-design. <laughs> but again, it's like a six month project. project. Yeah. Um, so this question is for John, but also for Wa'ed. Is queer a specific art position or a method for you? Um, and separately in the larger conversation slash community. So this is a longer question. I'll read the whole thing and you can answer what you can. Uh, queer is distinct from gay in some elements of our community. I'm asking, do you see the perspective or choices you would bring to a gay magazine client as potentially different from the method approach for a queer magazine. In your opinion, is uh, is this, is there such thing as queer aesthetic and approach? This is an interesting question, and um, and I think queer as a, as a like as a language, as like a vocab, as a word is a word that I prefer to use because I think it's very encompassing of a lot of different experiences. And I think for myself, like I, you know, identify as gay, I identify as bi, I identify as a, a lot of things. And I think queer allows that kind of umbrella language for me to have a range of flexibility in terms of my own presenting. And so when I'm using queer in these contexts, I would definitely think that some of these, some people might identify as gay or lesbian or same gender loving. I think there's a range of language that people use. And I find oftentimes the queer gay specific language is really generational, which I find to be quite interesting. Um, but I, I think you are, can also answer this question from the approach that the aesthetic of gay and queer, what does that mean? But I think the yeah. answer is that we don't really know because there's not have been enough study and archive. But I think, you know, again, like there is things. no, there's no like monolithic aesthetic. And I right. think one of the things that I personally like about, for example, the 10th magazine is that we get to delve into um, a rich historical vocabulary, a rich kind of thematic mm -hmm. vocabulary, but also we're really speaking to people's specific narratives that they're sharing in the issue. So it doesn't become, am I speaking for all queer people or am I designing an aesthetic for all queer people? It's really trying to create this, you know, again, visual vocabulary for, for that moment, for, for this, these, this, this specific, this specific uh, particular type of content. And so I think that's an interesting question. I mean, um, per, I, I don't use, I don't think they're mutually exclusive for my, the way that I use that language. I think that I use it in as, as inclusive as a way as possible, um, but do recognizing and also respecting the different ways that people in our community uh, identify themselves. If that answers your question. <laughs> Um, so I think uh, Sunny wants to add context to the question, so they're going to unmute themselves. Perfect. Hi. Hi. I'm so grateful y'all are here. I'm so drawn to your work. Um, my question is kind of like, I think, to your point about the generational difference, I think, I think some people use queer as a way, a lot of people do. I'm here in Atlanta and it's like a kind of a, I don't think it's a conversation, but it's almost like a conversation that's already been had. Um, 
and queer is often used as a way to describe going against and across multiple um, identities and unboxing yourself where like LGBT is still seen as kind of like in a box. Like you can basically be straight in the LGBT, but queer kind of, it undoes all kinds of stuff. So when I was talking about art, I'm wondering if art kind of follows that line or if you don't see a difference, meaning like with a magazine that might identify as LGBT, would there be more coloring in the margins? I wonder if like you, if you see queer something that is a, also like a cultural perspective when it comes to design. That is so, this is such a amazing question. I mean, you know, other, I guess other instances talking about the uh, language or the source of this word queer is again, we're reclaiming, like it was like a reclamation of a derogatory term in the seventies, right? Like that's when queer was starting to be reclaimed as, uh, as vocabulary uh, in our community, which I think to be also very interesting. So I think to your point, I think it does have a history of protest. I think it does have a history of uh, reclaiming what is dejected. I think it does have a history of filling the obscure voids that I think, and also for me, you know, like lesbian, gay, all of these things are just, it's like very European language and like the sources of all of that language, I think is also, you know, as a, you know, a person that is intersected with like black and like male and queer, you know, all of these different types of intersections. I think that like gay for me just really does speak to like whiteness. <laughs> and I think that's just, I mean, that's my definition. Like that's how I view that language. And I, and I get, I'm talking about how I view the language, how I using the language. And, but I think to your point of like this larger queer kind of uh, artistic conversation, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think, I, I think so. I think, I mean, I think by any person who is LGBTQ, queer, whatever, I, I just think like making art and putting your story out there is already an act of protest. And it's already creating a new visual landscape that doesn't exist. And people are hearing stories that they've never heard before. So in that way, I think it is this type of, are continuing this resistance um, in kind of dominated spaces. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so next question um, is a, bit different than what you were just talking about, but um, Zara asks, how do you communicate your ideas and opinions to clients? So I assume that's with um, projects that you're collaborating with institutions and um, yeah. We structure the process. I think I, I sometimes give this, this metaphor, which might be a little bit silly, is that when you go to the doctor and you have a problem, you expect them and you hope for them to kind of like be clear and give you a plan and tell you like, all right, here are the symptoms. Okay, good. We're going to do some tests. Based on these tests, we're going to decide it's going to be this or maybe that or see what else it might be. And then we're going to propose a solution and you're going to take it every, or this thing they're going to take. So they, they, you go in, you enter in more or less, you feel comfortable when you expect what to, you know what to expect. So I think it is your responsibility as a graphic designer who is running the, the show to also kind of put down a solid and meaningful process and explain it to the client and agree on it before you enter. And that might include a research phase after which things are agreed upon that become like a solidified direction of the project. And then showing a couple of design solutions. And that is typically a, a, a presentation with slides where we kind of explore the concept and break it down and kind of like re-explain it to them in a way that they can fall in love with it and adopt it. And then phase three is when is the design finalized, adopted, and then some application around it to finalize the project. So the way we present to the client is structuring the project is part of the managing the, pro the project, is part of presenting the project. And uh, I think it all affects the final outcome when a, pro a layout of the timeline that you're gonna abide by is clear. It makes it a lot easier to show the ideas. Okay, so that's all the questions from the audience, but I have one question for you guys. Um, what's next for Marcos Key? 
What's next for Marcos Key? I mean, <laughs> I mean, we, uh, you know, we just moved into a studio space like post Corona. I mean, we're, I guess still, we're, in corona. we're still in Corona, but like, <laughs> I guess like we're still in Corona, but we are, we just moved into a studio space, which has been a game changer for us. I mean, we're working on right now a, a bunch of editorial projects. Like we're working on a book for the MoMA, which is they're doing an exhibition about um, African-American architect architecture called Reconstructions. And so we're designing the exhibition um, kind of book that's going along with that. And we have a couple of book projects that we're doing with the Met. And we're happy, I mean, we have a lot of editorial projects, I think, and branding projects and typeface projects and all of that. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Wael and John, for sharing your evening with us. It was such a great discussion and the presentation was really enlightening. So yeah, I think that wraps everything up. I just wanted to invite everyone again to the Center for Book Arts to view the exhibition. It's really an incredible experience to delve into your library and, and your works. Um, and to be able to spend time with them. So I really recommend everyone to check it out. So with that, um, I thank you all for coming and thanks to Wael and John for joining us. Thank you for having us, it was a pleasure. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for everyone who came or is viewing it on Facebook or wherever. Thank you so much for listening. All right, have a good night, everyone. <laughs>